All right, good morning, Campfire. Let's see. Patrick, will you advance the screen, please? Sure. So, uh, good morning. Welcome to Low Code Campfire, episode number 42, March 18th. This is exciting because Patrick and I are co-hosting uh, because my internet like flaking out. And uh, so if I come and go today, it's not because I'm lazy. Anyway, this is Low Code Campfire, and uh, we have a pretty open discussion today anyway, Open Line Fridays. Uh, could you advance, please? So this is an event that we do every Friday, 10 a.m. Central, and it's a community gathering. It's an opportunity to uh, show what you're working on, ask about uh, questions you might have, talk about the experiences you're having with uh, Plant and App and in specific low code in general, and uh, it's an all skill levels event. We record all the past editions and all that's on our YouTube channel. You can see that um, there's a QR code there. You can use that to get to our YouTube channel. You can subscribe and, and you should set the alarm bell too so that you can uh, see when we post all these episodes. Um, yep. So we run a pretty informal agenda where we uh, uh, say hi and uh, since this is in a meeting format, everyone, anyone who wants to can say hi. We'll go around the campfire and uh, do first call, look at contributions to the campfire website, um, just generally talk about uh, what's, what's on your minds. Um, and when we get done, uh, we'll turn off the recording and we'll do afterglow, just uh, anything else that you want to talk about, uh, whether it's um, beer or politics or uh, even low code, we can continue to talk uh, after we turn off the recording. So engage with us next. Uh, yep, yeah, be nice, turn to mute your uh, mic if you've got noise going on behind you. Uh, the next one is the spot where, uh, next slide is usually where I say I'm gonna sing, but I'm not even gonna try and do that today. With <laughs> Submit your questions and topics in advance. There's lots of opportunities to do that. So with that, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning everybody. Good morning, sir. Good morning. There's nothing more fun than, you know, 10 minutes before. Uh, I, I've never actually had it happen before, but here we are 10 minutes before <laughs> the event and the internet goes out and I went on my phone this morning, so I'm glad to have Patrick running the show. It's like having a producer. It's nice to know that when it said Dale Internet Impaired, it was talking about your connection and not you personally. <laughs> yes, correct. Uh, so anyway. Cool, let's do first call. What's going on? Hi, Dale. Um, I just put it in the chat, but I'm wondering if we can talk a bit about uh, DNN user roles versus plant and app roles and, and why they're separated like the way they are. Um, we're, we're struggling a little bit to get really solid understanding of why we have to add users to the plant and app users role. Okay. Well, yeah, we can help with that. and. Uh, again, Patrick, Patrick is a real good resource on this one. So uh, first, can you, uh, I mean, do you want to tell us a little bit more about how it is you're struggling or do you want us to just talk about what, what we had in mind? Well, we're doing something to our site that uh, allows users to self-identify um, and they do a lookup in our backend systems to do that. And um, it, it has to be very secure. So um, we want to make sure that things can happen, like um, being able to attempt to self-identify as some other user. And so when you have an entity, we have an entity created to track what the users are up to. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing things properly that you can't, uh, for instance, you know, if the API is created to 
manipulate your attempt counts. We're going to make sure that that's not available. But if we need something available um, that you're not able to manipulate some other user's um, uh, entity. So it's really about the understanding of what the roles do. And, um, you know, if, if we have to do special lookups in the background, I, I, I know I'm being quite vague, but it's, uh, right. yeah, just a base understanding that we're looking to get buttoned down. So, uh, I think I'll take a, a first stab at it and then Patrick can correct me because I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Great. so we ship with, uh, some out of the box roles and, uh, uh, users is the, is the lowest level of roles. And so all that is, uh, when you're dealing with Clinton app, um, permissions, you can you can set what you want a user to be able to do, that whether or not they can add or uh, edit or delete no records, their own records or all records. Um, and then we also have a roles mechanism so that you can add your own roles. These are also DNN um, roles, but uh, so, but they're just, identified as also being connected with plant and app so they'll show up on our management screens and so you can provide more fine-tuned uh, ability to work with uh, rather than just users as a general class you can have different classes of users or different capabilities uh, that, mm -hmm. that gets assigned to users so that's so you see i did the kindergarten level now patrick <laughs> Well, I, I don't know if I add a whole lot other than um, the the main the main thing that I you probably already realize, but I just want to make sure is very clear about the uh, um, the plant and app roles, which are which are in the two role groups called built-in and app roles. In your DNN list of role groups, you have a role group called built-in and a role group called app roles. And okay. those two role groups are what is called when you get to the permissions tab of your entity builder. Um, mm -hmm. So when you're creating an entity and you go to the permissions tab, the roles that you see there are, are roles um, that are either in the built-in or app roles uh, role group. When you add a new role through Plantin app, it gets added to the app roles role group. And um, okay. So this is a this is a way um, for Plant and App to be very specific about um, about uh, um, the roles that you're going to see in the entity permissions. Um, does that I mean is, are those things yep. you understood already, or does that help some? Or um, the, those are things that we understood. Yeah. Um, okay. I, you mentioned two groups. I'm kind of interested in the third group which is pre-existing DNN roles, which our site is, uh, uh, it's, it, it, yeah, I think we have about 50 or 60 roles mm -hmm. for different users and they don't show up anywhere in plant and app. And I'm wondering why that might be the case or like, is there a path to be able to declare yeah. those as being available in plant? You app? just, yeah, you, you just change their role group to app roles and they'll show up. Ah, um, yeah, so we have, I think, six uh, role groups. So really, it's is there another path to uh, include them in the plan app other than so, putting them in the app roles? And so your role groups are used in other ways that you yeah, yeah that you don't want to. Uh, yeah, I understand that definitely. And um, I'm not aware of a, of a way for that offhand, but I can certainly uh, we can certainly take that to. Um, uh, to someone else. I'm just looking to see uh, which of my colleagues okay. are in the meeting right now. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't see any of the ones I'd want to see. <laughs> Not that, no, no, I'm, I'm very glad that Dale and Linda are both here. But <laughs> that was but, hurtful, uh, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> wow, I really, I really put my foot in my mouth there, didn't I? <laughs> We can make a note to Mihai to just sniff that part of the <laughs> right. Um, um, no, but I, I, I don't. You know, our idea was that you know, we were introducing something new, and so that's why we picked the Plant and App. You know, the App Roles World Group and uh, yep. put 
you know, things designate things in there. I don't think we anticipated that uh, there, there would be app role groups that um, are role groups that, that you'd want to use, uh, continue to use and, and embed into plant an app. So that, that is a challenge. Okay. Um, just, you know, it sounds like you have a pretty um, involved scenario. If it were simpler, yeah. you could take the approach of, of uh, duplicating and you know, duplicating the ones that need to be. And that, the, that really brings up a question, is there is there a limited number of them that need to be into the plant and app roles that you could, if they're a member of role A, you also give them B so that they, uh, they have yeah. plant and app security. I, I think we're trying to keep it as simple as possible and, and putting our existing roles as needed into the app uh, roles would probably be our preference. But um, yeah, it might just be as simple as uh, saying all the existing roles go into the app roles or the ones that we need. So that, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that with the plant and app guys to say, yeah. hey, is there another way? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and I, I understand where you're coming from because I, in the past, have used role groups in custom ways um, in, in some of the my implementations. So I, I get that. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Absolutely. Cool. What else? Hi, Dale. Jerry here. Um, Jim, Anthony, and I have been banging around on something and didn't know if anybody has, was aware of this, but on the um, the uh, add-on, the email sync add-on that allows you to have an email come into your system and you can rake files off of that email and then do data processing on it. It's just, just a wonderful program. Um, Jim and I were having trouble getting the IMAP side of things to work. It was just kind of goofy. And uh, Jim will jump in here and tell us what exactly he found. But uh, when you're trying to trigger an action based on something in the subject line or whatever, it seemed like uh, Jim had to do a different syntax, a regex syntax differently on the IMAP than the POP3. And I know this is a little micromanaged because it would take someone who actually knows and uses that module regularly, which we do. But what brought it into focus for us was, um, it, if I didn't dream this, I heard a comment that maybe the POP3 version of this program was going to be um, dropped at some point. And so Jim and I went to work on our code to see what we could find where that might be problematic for us. And um, just wondering if, if anybody else was seeing this, they could they could gain from what Jim learned this week, and or be prepared in the future if we do drop the pop three. Um, I for one don't really know what the difference is, and our pop three version has been running along just fantastic for years. But if I have to drop it and go to IMAP, uh, Jim and I were concerned it wouldn't work. But he came up with a quick solution on his side. But uh, I just didn't know if you were aware of this or if any of this means anything to anybody else on the call. <laughs> Well, first of all, I'll say that you didn't dream it. We uh, did get into a discussion. Uh, uh, we did discuss the idea that the pop um, trigger is um, going obsolete. And my understanding of that is that it's an older technology that I mean, it requires us to pull um, the, the email box rather than we, uh, IMAP works the other way. We get tapped on the shoulder to say, hey, you have an email. And so it's it's a faster, better, newer delivery of emails. And as far as I know, everybody supports both. So of course, everybody, meet, you know, big um, mail services, like certainly Google. Um, so the, 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 uh, the thought was that pop purpose and it's it's a um, perfless older and it's a, a maintenance issue for us. So that's kind of how we um, came to, to the thought that we're going to obsolete pop. Um, and then syntax difference. I, uh, and Jim, if you're 
on and available and want to tell us what you found that would be, uh, I think it would be interesting. So um, what I found was in when I had this working via pop, um, I would get one, one new file downloaded. And um, if I tried it via IMAP on a subject line filter, I would get all the files in any email that matched. And I found that my regex syntax on the pop client was not this uh, giving the same result as it did in IMAP and did a little research on regex um, to fix the syntax on the matching. And then the IMAP started working where I would just get a single file. Um, the, the, you know, I, I consider it a, a programming bug on my part in that the pop, the pop client um, had, was a, using, allowing me to use a, a filter string that the IMAP client was much more um, restricted on or more proper. So I, I don't know if that's just an older code base in the pop client. So um, that that would be why it, the IMAP being a newer uh, newer base code, you know, maybe truer to the standard than the old one. And I can I can put the the I'll, I'll put the two differences in the chat. Um, okay, so. I would certainly appreciate that. I noticed that, I mean, I, I have a couple of um, tests that I run against our, uh, when, when we come up with a new version, I have a, well, I've got about 50 tests that I run to of all the things that have come up in support over the years. And uh, I have a couple that filtered mail by pop uh, and I mean, rather, yes, filter email both by pop and by IMAP. And uh, I wasn't aware that there's, I see that both from a configuration standpoint, it says filter email by subject, and there's a checkbox that says use regex. I wasn't aware that there's a difference, but they are in fact different code bases. And that's part of why uh, we're not excited about maintaining both. Well, and I think it has to do not so much with the code line as this, the way the two clients work, where pop, pop must keep some sort of counter of, Oh, I already got that S message and bring it down. Um, and so it looks and says, oh, you only have one message and my bad line of code, it you know only only matched one one message that it had to bring down and pop, where with IMAP it's going and doing um, some sort of search of the mailbox and matching a bunch of files. Uh, Hmm. Yeah, um, Patrick, do you have any exposure to this? I, uh, I mean, I certainly have uh, done a lot of, you know, I've implemented these before. Um, probably, but I suspect that maybe you've had more. Um, you've done it more times than I have. But um, is your IMAP filter? So remember what um, Dale said about uh, that. That uh, with IMAP, you know, you know, the the um, the trigger gets gets kind of told when to run. So that there's a difference there as opposed with uh, with pop. It's a, uh, you know, you, you have to, it's more of a schedule sort of thing. But um, I'm wondering if you have the uh, the trigger only for new emails uh, options set in the IMAP. I, I did. Okay. And, yeah, okay. And it just seemed to ignore that and it ignored the date time. It did, I, okay. I, I was. And we had a discussion like this last week, didn't we? Right. I mean, that's what yeah, yeah. Like I raised it and I couldn't mm -hmm. figure it out. And then, you know, as doing some work with it came back to, okay, this is, I mean, it, it boils down to my bad use of a red regex, I think, um, you know, string uh, that it, but, and, and just the difference between the two clients gave, the regex strings resulted in in two different um, two different sets. Maybe because Pop is downloading the message and it knew it already downloaded it, where you know IMAP kept going back out and reading them. 
trying to figure out how to put this into chat. There it is. Did you send that or are you still? No, there yeah. we go. Yep. Yep. See you now. <laughs> Yeah, while he's Thanks analyzing that, it, it's this is what makes Campfire wonderful. Just this exact scenario right here that we have something that is so obscure that normally, you know, how many other people across the planet are having this conversation right now? I'm guessing <laughs> zero. And uh, you know, but it's this kind of stuff. So my my initial reason for bringing it up was if we're going to drop pop three, let's make sure IMAP is running fine because some of us really rely on this service uh, immensely. And it yeah. uh, looks like that it, maybe it's not an issue with IMAP at all that uh, Jim just messed it all up and freaked us all out. No, I'm just kidding, Jim. But, uh, <laughs> the, but the fact is, is, is as long as we know the solution, it's all good. You know, and then you can drop pop three and off we go. But uh, I just really appreciate calls like this. And, and so just to kind of jump into the, to the end, make sure I understand. You got IMAP working exactly the way you want it to at the end? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It was. So far, it appear, appears to be. It's only been going a few days. Okay, I've had, um, yeah, in, in, in my testing, I've, um, the, the IMAP has been really steady and reliable, other than I, I think I mentioned maybe on last week's discussion about this, that it, it disconnected me and, and Mark gave the solution, hey, you, you really have to sign into that account uh, in order to keep it alive, um, you know, Google was treating it as a security thing that I wasn't connecting. And it turns out, you know, it's user error, right? I uh, uh, plant an app, we moved from Dan and Sharp addresses to plant an app addresses, and I was authorizing it against Dan and Sharp and then never signing into that. So it was, in fact, you know, not happy with the fact that I don't have a regular use of that account. And now I've moved it to Plantin app. So hopefully I'll, I'll maintain uh, connectivity on, on my account. But um, yeah, there's, there's in ins and outs of this, both from the mail side and our side. And in this case, the line where I was matching with an asterisk for a regex, you know, um, isn't, the, isn't the right way to, to write that line of code to get what I, my result. The second, the second version matches the regex documentation. So, I, yep. and it's like, oh, and just by chance, it had been working for a long time with pop. So, um, so since your efforts were around moving to IMAP, uh, I was just wondering if you, uh, you probably didn't spend much time on the pop side, but I was wondering if, if you did and whether, whether the, correct expression in, uh, in, in pop would work. I, I did not go back to it, but I can, it's easy enough to do. I, that was more of curiosity on, on my side. And, and, you know, unfortunately it seems like week by week, my, uh, when I get into these meetings, my, my thing to say is, well, you know, that's another one of those things that I don't know much about and, and regex is one of them. So, uh, <laughs> just uh, can't be good at everything and that's one of them that, another one that i'm not so thanks for you finding that yeah uh, it, it's it's like i said more of a, a difference between the way the two clients work so one didn't seem to care as much as the other but I, I will yeah. i will look at the pop and see, see if the same phrase same regex expression would have get would still work in, in pop. So. so there's a, um, oh, probably a related discussion that came up this week. And uh, I mean, not, not particularly IMAP and, and uh, pop, but rather just syntax and differences in how we treat things. Um, and I'm, it escapes me at the moment who, who brought, it's probably somebody on this call brought up the, uh, the question about how to use uh, filters in a list. And 
Um, so you, you have a list of things like you select out all your users and then you want to, uh, and, and that's in a list, what we used to call entities, but now a list. And you want to execute actions for each list item and filter and only show a limited number uh, uh, to be able to filter in on, on rows that have a specific property. So um, I'm sure you're all nodding your head. You know exactly what I'm talking about now since I'm trying to do it verbally. But that filtering, we couldn't get it to work. The client couldn't get it to work. I couldn't get it to work. And I had to get a developer involved. And it turns out that the, the, the syntax was you put in a field name uh, the, or property name in that list, and then the value that you want to filter for, and um, and it would return only those. And, and it turns out that that um, that property name or field name is um, case sensitive. And so this is talking about just generally inconsistencies. We we try. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Patrick. So you can find it for me. Um, so yeah, you put in the, the list name, you put in the field and value and the, the, the field name is case sensitive. And so depending on how the list was constructed, you have to know the case. And so other, when you know that this, this filtering mechanism works great. Um, the, uh, the discussion that, that we held within the product team is that most of our product is case insensitive. And uh, I mean, it's like 95% case insensitive. And then we have these particular areas where there's little differences and it can make you crazy. So uh, for this particular one, we're, we're gonna change it uh, to, to, so that the field can be case insensitive. So you don't have to look at how it's constructed. The value will continue to be uh, case sensitive so that you can, you can filter for the th exact thing that you want. But, um, it is, and then we'll improve the, the inline documentation to say, um, to explain that. But it, I, I bring this up only to say that there are places where we're inconsistent in the product and we're working to make it be more consistent. Does anybody run into things like this that we should also be paying attention to or? Uh, or any other comments about inconsistencies or on to the next topic. <laughs> anyway, you know, I feel like that I, I feel I don't know if any anybody has, ex, has experienced that thing, but I, I feel like that at some point in the past, I actually was struggling with this and I and I just figured out some other way to do what I needed to do. <laughs> and, and probably it was the, uh, it, it probably was uh, the case in, sens in um, sensitivity that, uh, you know, that was my, gotcha. yeah, yep. I suspect. And, and, and that is the thing. It's sometimes it's, uh, you, you bang your head against the wall for a while and then you just, you move on. Uh, it would be very easy, for example, to, 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 to construct the list a different way or to do an additional SQL call, for example, to let mm -hmm. SQL do the filtering for you. And then if you yeah. do dance filtering, that's what you're going to have to do anyway, because this is only doing a two of, um, you, you can do a field and an equal, and that's it. There is no greater than, less than, or not equal mm -hmm. or anything else. It's just field equals value you, uh, with, with ands, right? You can do a, you can add filter and uh, the add filter button there, you can have multiples and they're, yep. they're additive ends. But if um, if that doesn't happen to meet what you need, then you're gonna have to filter it a different way anyway. But also I'm sure um, everyone is, does this too, but uh, this that very that very thing is the reason why I do so much copying and pasting. Because yes. if you if you if you copied the field from you know from where you you know and and pasted it in here, you would uh, certainly not have the uh, that uh, case issue. So to benefit the people that are on this call and, and the people who might listen afterwards, I'll point out that lists the, the just the whole list construct is also case sensitive. If you create a list, for example, on What's our action load list from SQL, load list from JSON, something like that. Uh, maybe you can 
find one here. Um, yeah, so create list from something, create list from SQL. When you create it and you give it a list name, that is case sensitive. When you consume it elsewhere, you have to use it that same way. So you, the thing that you just pointed out of copying and pasting mm -hmm. will, will keep you out of will keep you out of trouble. But we're I, again when I see these and to the degree that I that we can do it without making the product uh, we can do easily within the product we're trying for case insensitive that's where the product is as a whole cool okay I have feedback for Patrick then we okay, sure this the certification question on our tokens our tokens case sensitive because you don't, don't aren't you well in general for my tokens it's they're not <laughs> <laughs> they um so this is a, and that's a, what that goes back to what uh, um dale was talking about um that uh, as a as a general rule in in plant and app um uh, things are not case sensitive, uh, but this is where you know something we recently learned is. Um, but yeah, as a as a general rule for tokens, um, case sensitivity does not matter. Okay. Yep. So, uh, um, so I I accept the feedback because we've learned something new, definitely. But <laughs> but when uh, yeah, like when so and and actually the questions on uh, the, the certification test were actually created by um, by uh, many many people in the company. Uh, a lot from our implementation team. A lot of those questions came from them, and that was uh, that was one of them. Um, and I'm not trying to say, oh, it's not my fault. <laughs> just trying to, I'm just trying to say that I, that I'm not the only one that came up with the question. So uh, they're definitely uh, peer reviewed, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I get you. Um, that that question in this context suddenly the um, the correct answer doesn't seem quite as correct anymore. Yeah, yeah. agreed. All right, what else? It seems like uh, it seems like we might have had a contribution. Patrick, can you jump over to Campfire? So these both say three eleven. Uh, I think I think we demonstrated slide form open last week. That was a good one if we're, uh, and it wouldn't take long to show anyway, if you want to uh, hit go on that one. Oh yeah, I remember you, uh, um, yeah, you, I think we did take a look at this one. Yeah, we did. So yeah, we yep. can slide down. Yep. So rather than popping into existence, it, it, a more gentle uh, appearance. So that was fun. And so that's available. And for anybody who had, is not already part, uh, who is on this call and not part of campfire.plantinop.com, uh, this is where we put the tech you can use. And if you're new to the call and you want to put your email in the chat, uh, I will uh, happily add you to Campfire so that you can look at these things directly. Okay, so if you want to jump back to uh, contributions and let's take a look at the one that, that uh, Jim gave us. So this is the, the, the an issue where um, you might not have control over a data source to be able to get it to sort in the way that you want it to sort when it's uh, you can't control the sort order by adding a sort clause to the or an order by clause to the SQL, for example. You you've got a data source and you can't control it. So this contribution, go ahead. And, lets you say that um, that you can add the um, query string parameters to it. Uh, and yep. is there a... Uh, so, yep, excellent. So we'll go ahead and take a look at that. But uh, so, uh, Jim, you're just saying that we, uh, if we just add this, uh, this JavaScript right here into the initialization of the grid, then we will have our um, initial sort. Right, and there's two grids. The 
there's two grid samples down there. One is how how it's initialized and one, you know, the same data coming back, but one with the initialization, one without. Okay. Yep. So this is the default sort I'm coming from the data source, and this is where right. you've uh, where you've uh, done your JavaScript. I see. Yep. Just take a look at that, and here's where he put in the uh, the JavaScript to uh, uh, to add the um, the sorting for the uh, for the module, and the and so this is the uh, the module ID here that we need to. Uh, um, these are the uh, the parameters that um, get added to the um, to the URL to uh, to to the initial sort. And those can be uh, if you interactively work with the grid, those will pop up automatically, right? Yes, so, right. Yeah, if you interact with the with the grid and hit, if you wanted it to, con to configure it differently, you can use. You can interactively get the grid the way you want to, and then use that to get to pull what you need. Yeah. So if you added uh, um, the uh, um, the sort options to the fields, and, and so you yeah, if I do this, then you can see that on uh, now I've added the uh, um, description, and this is for the for his the, the module number change because this is for the one where he didn't put the JavaScript. But uh, um, so I could uh, um, grab that right there and. Um, just add exactly. another uh, yeah another line of uh, of js there to uh, to sort it by that thank you and in in the documentation the plant and app documentation it talked about if you left off the module number it might affect all the grids in the uh, on the page as opposed mm -hmm. to targeting it so that's why in my notes i made sure you I put the, make sure you put the id on there otherwise you can't have two grids they would all sort the same way. That's my, yeah. my interpretation. Yeah, and I guess what uh, what Dale was just saying is, if you were unsure about exactly what you what your parameter should be, you could uh, also you know do this, uh, just do the the sort for uh, that uh, um, that the grid does automatically, and then grab your information from the um, from the URL like that too. That way, you know you have the the um, the right Oops. module number. Yeah, yeah, the right module number. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Highlighting the wrong thing. So, uh, Patrick, again, I'm putting you in the correct me if I'm wrong spot, but I think that um, in, as we migrate to the grids, listings, there's the ability to pick an override, pick a different name for the so you don't have to use the module the ID sort 7670 or whatever. You can pick a different prefix as part of the configuration. Of the yeah, yeah, and you're so, right. Yeah. Which from a, uh, from a URL construction standpoint, it's nicer. It, it could be the, you know, it could be contri contributions, for example, instead of sort, uh, sort 670. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that gives a different look at it. And then, um, but it also, Brings up the point that if you're um, if you're doing things like this and you can work with Bootstrap Five Grid, that you may have some work to do in in cleaning up your linkages now that it's now that you've chosen to to react to have to use a custom prefix, your JavaScript might need to be updated. Right. Yeah. So that definitely will help in uh, creating uh, friendlier URLs. Good. All right, that's uh, contributions. What else? Oh, I know. Let's see. Can you jump back to the presentation? I think there might be another slide in there. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, we did that one. Okay, nope, there was a slide. Uh, I'll just do a, a programming note. There was some discussion last week about um, multi-portal. And uh, engage Bogdan on the topic, and we are looking at. I believe. Do we have? Do we have a campfire on April first? Uh, now I, I, I almost know what I'm doing here. Let me see. Yes, 
two mm -hmm. weeks from now, April 1st, yep. um, we're, we're going to uh, uh, plan to engage again on that one with him present and, and uh, the opportunity to, to talk about what's going on for you, particularly with uh, multi-portal, your scenarios, and and, uh, and we'll explain more about our strategies. So don't miss that one. What else? That's good to know, Dale. We'll be paying attention for that. But uh, <laughs> that's kind of funny that you're going to put that on April Fool's Day, though. I uh, thought that too, but I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, it gives us the ability to say, uh, no, we were kidding. <laughs> I, um, I don't know. Is that a thing in Romania? April? <laughs> I, I wore green yesterday just in case. Uh, you know, the same sort of stuff. Yeah, it actually is. <laughs> oh, Bogdan, you're here. <laughs> so April Fool's Day is is a thing in Romania? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, a lot okay. of pranks happening during that. Yeah. I don't know. As a as an IT guy with a funny sense of with a, I don't know, funny is the right word, sense of humor, the, you know, the, this file has been deleted, uh, you know, missing data kind of prank was my standard go to. <laughs> Anybody have a good one? Uh, hey, Dale, ex Dale, this is Albert. I, I had a question. I've been working on a, on a, I guess one of the, the free trial sites and I came across where the, I was using the Creta, CSV or create a list from the CSV source. And I, I got it, you know, I got it to work to, Im to import the file, but it, it won't import the file because it's a, uh, because I don't have access to be able to add the dot CSV file as a, as a lit, as a file that's allowed to be uploaded. Yes. Is there a way that, because there's this limited permissions that I guess you have to be able to add that to it, but is there a way you can do it uh so i, I, I think i can that, uh, Patrick, give me a, yeah if you give me a second let me pull up a site and i can <laughs> i can uh well, patrick, so there's a yeah go ahead Dale. yep yeah no, i was gonna say well patrick's looking for that i i believe uh, the answer is since the that free site is um with limited permissions, I think your only answer would be to to create a console case uh, and support could do that for you. We'll probably okay. have to look into whether that's a great plan uh, for us to do that. But in the meantime, that's all that I know. I guess I um, so I didn't. I, yeah, I, I I just heard. Um, ability to upload CSV and I didn't, uh, I'm sorry, I kind of uh, missed the rest of what you're, so yeah. you're saying. Maybe if you don't have the permissions to make the changes you need to do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're it would yeah. be under the yeah. system security yeah. tab, which we're not providing access to. Yes. I understand. Okay. I would say, I, I, I think if you were to, um, to do a support request like that, be happy to take care of it. Just tell us the name of the site that you're, that you're doing. Um, okay. Yeah, I can do that. Definitely. Thank you, Dale. Appreciate it. Sure. And you know, I wonder if we, I, I wonder why we, uh, I don't know where those sites are uh, cloned out of, but it would make sense that certain things like XLSX and CSV, I know I've had to do that for myself uh, as well, require some post access or higher level access to do. Good one. Um, in the sh just uh, thinking about that one, Albert, um, there is the oh, it won't accept it as a file upload to start with. Is that what you're saying? Or it won't let you? That's correct. Yeah, you, it won't. It gives me an error saying it's uh, uh you know, it's um, you know, not a unsupported yeah file. Yeah. So I, it might be, I guess it might be a thing where it actually, when you do add it to the form, maybe it, it warns you that you need to add it 
you know, add the .csv or whatever the, the file might be, might be a good addition to to that when you ever, anybody adds it to a, it to check to see if the files if the file types allowed. Yep. Yeah, or even it just puts up a warning that says, you know, you, you might want to make sure you you have you've already added this to the, you know, the allowed allowed list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question. What else? Is everybody, I just want to check. I know this wasn't your, your question, Albert. Now I understand that, but does everybody know the things you have to do there? Because it's pretty buried. <laughs> so, is it, or is it, does anybody want to see that? I should say. Oh, if you've got it, let's bring it up. We're talking about it. Let's do it. Okay. All right. So, um, which screen? There we are. Yep. Uh, so there's, uh, first you have to go under, it, you can do it by site, but um, in order to do it by site, you have to make sure that you go um, and and uh, for the entire instance, you have to make sure that it's uh, allowable. So you go um, to your cog and to security and uh, you have to, um, you have to add it under here for allowable file extensions. And then by site, you can go under site settings. Oh, and I'm sorry. I. Let me go back here because I told you how buried it was. You have to go to security and then to the more tab and then to more security settings. So it's uh, that's that's uh, the, down. yeah, yeah. Um, that's and then cool. for sites for individual sites, uh, you go, uh, am I in the right place now? I'm this one I didn't look at ahead of time. Um, yes, here we go site behavior and then more. And then um, the allowable file extensions here. Um, so by choosing the default, you're getting the ones from the um, the default ones from the host right. setup. Yeah, yeah. Security. Yeah. Cool. cool. Anything else? I can offer uh, one question that's going to be poorly formatted, but because uh, I'm not the primary developer on what we're doing, but uh, I've heard that doing an entity lookup and getting the data with a sub token, um, so you know, in particular date formats, uh, they're trying to use the ISO or the UTC sub token, and that works fine. But when they have to do a get all and they do a json uh, uh parse it's not offering the same type of formatting so they're struggling with getting dates out the same way using the json lookup does that make any sense it does, it does okay yeah. and and i guess this is a question on uh consistency is there plans to make that more consistent, add more sub tokens, be able to do the same thing that you do with tokens with the JSON parsing? <laughs> this is a timely subject. <laughs> We've oh, been doing, good. doing a lot of talking about uh, about dates. Um, uh, and I don't know, um, Bogdan, since you're on the call, I don't know if you want to uh, um, just chat about some of the changes we put in place. and. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, we are we are actually revamping the the date picker to be more user friendly. But I think uh, what Andrew asks is more about the back end of it, so more about the the um, uh, sub tokens in the in the entity actions. Uh, yeah. So it's a timely subject because yes, we are working on this and actually it will be part of one twenty a major, major event that we did but this one is not is not on the list uh, but uh, now it is especially if you put well, it on, on the feature request <laughs> list so I was just looking at our at our uh, product management document and I see that for example read entity uh, run SQL and create list from SQL we had put down as a goal to return the exact same values for date. So I assume that's all the same subtokens, but 
Oh, is there is there another one if the if, if the if list? I, yeah. If I understand correctly, and Andrew, Andrew, you can you can uh, tell us more. Understand that you convert that to a JSON uh, list, and then you convert it back. That's my understanding. I think it's more um, doing. Uh, a lookup of multiple records in our particular use case, as opposed to one entity record. Um, mm -hmm. That's why they had to do the JSON uh, transform mm -hmm. or or parse. Um, and are they using the um, the read the read all um, action? The, you know, the, the entity that the, the entity action is created by Plantin up the read the read all entity action, or are they using um, a SQL query. No, they're using the read all. They are. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. So that's a scenario I think that um, that um, uh, um, that we should take a close look at and just uh, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And I think this ties in well with what we are discussing internally as well of connecting the entities to lists because if it was a list, probably it would have been a lot easier and built in rather than going through json mm. okay thank you helpful <laughs> that said we'll probably be coming to you guys with uh questions on how to work around this for now since this is a uh, ways off there are some uh, i'm not sure if it will help i'm just throwing it out there there is uh, there are some uh, the tokens that are used for date conversions. So I'm not sure if you if you got a chance to look at those, if they help or not. Um, that is beyond uh, the depth of what I've been involved in. So uh, I'll bring that back to the developers though, for sure. Thanks. Well, I guess we're on to another programming note that um, in Locode Cafe on Wednesday, uh, Bogdan is going to be displaying a lot of the new features from 1.20. Date and time is likely to be part of uh, of that presentation, so worth showing up and, and or reviewing the um, the recording for that one. All right, I'm almost to the end of our hour, but there's still time for for the question that you've been afraid to ask. I've got one if, 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 uh, please. So I have some JSON being returned from a call that's got embedded single quotes or single quotes in the data coming back. And when I'm trying to put that, I need to put that into a JavaScript uh, to line it up to a, a field in an action form. Um, is there a, a function to, to escape those single quotes to keep it in, in the data, but um, allow me to you know, move it into a, a JavaScript uh, function? Because what happens now is the JavaScript blows up because it, it um, sees that sing, embedded single quote and and says it's invalid data, invalid JavaScript. I think I've dealt with that before, but um, I'm uh, I'm I'm not remembering what I what I did. Um, anybody else have any ideas? I do. Just to verify, you're the you're trying to put on string into a um, into some JavaScript, right? I mean, the into actual string, like you're trying to set up. Yeah, the actual function I'm doing is from our campfire a few weeks ago. I have a a grid that's returning data from a an API call and. I need to move that selected row into a form. And what, 
the data in the grid has the embedded quote in it. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you probably um, escape it with um, with Razor. I hadn't thought about using Razor to escape it first. That might that might work. I'll go look at that. Um, on that particular one, it kind of, it's it's kind of difficult. Um, and there is a string sub a string replacement that is available in tokens, but mm -hmm. it would probably read that as a. You, you, um, it gets it gets kind of funny when. The delimiters of tokens are all the delimiters you're trying to search for. I've also done something like that with a uh, with a SQL query as well. It's kind of roundabout, but difficult to uh, when you're dealing with delimiters. Painful. Did you? Um... Did you happen to try the string uh, token or? I, I have not um, yet. You know, so would the string token, would they use that to wrap around the other token that's the grid value? Is that how you? Yeah, and I'm just wondering, I, you know, I know that there's, if, if you wrapped it with double quotes, that would definitely not work but i you know i'm not sure it, it's just a it's something worth trying the most simplistic approach first and then you know and then when it doesn't work go <laughs> to, the, to the next level but uh um it's an idea uh if you but if you wrapped it in single quotes instead of the instead of double quotes then um but maybe you have single quotes in your data also i don't know no i do have single quotes in the yeah data okay it's, it's getting measurement it's yeah. good. And there's double quotes in there too because the data coming back is feet and inches and in yeah. describing yeah. the item out. Yeah. So that uh, that nixes that one. Yeah, I've seen um, razor razor or stupid the answer. If you okay. uh, feel free if you bang your head on it feel free to enter a ticket or put it on the community forum and i'll bang my head on it for a while as well yeah. okay so uh i believe we've reached the end of our hour and had a lot of good topics so thanks on everyone for attending uh we'll go to campfire for today i'm going to turn off the recording anybody let's see patrick this is the spot where you got to move forward to happy low coding uh <laughs> if uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you guys again next week. Feel free to hang around uh, and, and we'll chat for a few minutes. Thank you all. <laughs>